Hello, my name is Philip Bloom and welcome to my kitchen, the place where not that much cooking gets done, but I talk to camera a fair bit. In fact, if you watched my Cinematic Masterclass, if you bought that, episode one is almost entirely set here where I go through all the incredibly important stuff you need to know about how cameras work, their settings, all that sort of stuff before I go out and out and film the rest of the episodes on location. Today though, I am going to be talking about this camera here. Oh, that's a bit loose. Panasonic EVA1. This is Panasonic's first sub 10,000 camcorder since the AF100 slash 101, which was a long time ago. And back then the AF100 slash 101 was the only larger sensor. When I say larger, it wasn't like as big as this or other cameras, because it was micro four thirds, but it was the first one to come along, video camera that had a larger sensor for well under $10,000 since the DSLR revolution. After that, they didn't bring out anything for that market. The cheapest camera they've made in all of that time is the very Cam LT, which is a very, very good camera. But is this the camera that people have been waiting for? Or is this something which is really very similar to what we already have? Find out in this review. So what are the headline features of this camera? Well, obviously the first one is it is sub $10,000 by a fair bit. The exact price of course depends on at what point in the future you're watching this, where you live in the world, and if you have any good dealers who can give you some good deals. The other thing is it's small. It's light, it's really light. I mean, we do have, forgive the plane. This is the problem with living in the flight path but at least I've referred to it now. So now when you hear the next plane, you'll go, oh, it's a plane. It's okay though, I get a good 45 seconds between planes going overhead. It's a perfect place to be filming this sort of stuff. Anyway, uh, with all these add-on stuff, it is a bit heavier, but it is incredibly light for a camera. I am a big fan of light cameras. That's part of the reason why I love shooting on smaller cameras still, like the A7S IIs. Uh, there's other reasons why I love those cameras as well, but part of the reason is I like to have small cameras. When I'm out shooting documentaries, I like to be able to move quickly and not draw too much attention to myself, but still have fantastic images. So size is important. In fact, smaller is better. I would say that, wouldn't I? It is surprising that Panasonic have taken this long to really get back into this part of the market. The irony is they already make a really fantastic camera for not that much money. They have done for a few years, but this one here, the Panasonic GH5, is a superb camera. And I haven't done a review of it, I'm afraid. Uh, maybe I will at some point, but I'm kind of going past the point of doing a review. It is really good. The downside it really is micro four thirds sensor. So it's a tiny sensor and tiny sensor where size actually is important. You want a bigger one for a um, sensor. I can put this back on, there we go. But the cool thing about the GH5 is it has some very professional features within it. It has 10 bit internal recording, whereas everything else is eight bit. All the other DSLRs or mirrorless cameras are eight bit. So having all of that extra color information is so important. It really is. It also has much better color. Like in fact, with the firmware update, you can record like 400 megabits a second. You are gonna need like crazy fast SD cards, which generally means more expensive SD cards. But to have 10 bit internal recording in 4K is great. It shoots up to 60p in 4K which is fantastic. There's only other, one other camera right now that I know of. This will change obviously in the future. And that's the Canon 1DX Mark II, which I love as well, but for very different reasons. I think it's an amazing camera and its autofocus is really one of its killer, killer features. The other thing about the GH5 that's so good, apart from the 10-bit 
apart from the 4K 5060 and uh, the high bit rates, is a really, really good five axis stabilized sensor. No video cameras have this as of yet. And it's the biggest thing I miss, to be honest with you, after shooting with an A7S II, an A7R II, or GH5, the biggest thing I miss is not having a stabilized sensor. In fact, I've been using the um, Nikon D850 for a little bit to try out, and I will be taking a review of it, hopefully. Um, and it's really nice. But the th biggest thing that hampers that camera, that holds it back, is the lack of a stabilized sensor, meaning if you want to do any handheld, because it's a DSLR, you can't use the viewfinder, so you're not having that stability of holding it. And you need an IS lens, and there's not that many IS lens out there um, which are fast, so it's not primes. So that's kind of one of the things I really, really miss when I'm using video cameras is stabilized. There's no stabilized sensor on this. There's no stabilized sensor on the Sony FS5, the FS7, or any of the C-Line. It doesn't exist. There's no stabilized sensors. We need them. We do need them, so please, whoever's watching this, who's making camera, make a stabilized sensor. You can do it for full frame, so that means you can do it for Super 35. So whilst it doesn't have uh, a stabilized sensor, the camera does have electronic image stabilizer at the button here. Um, it's okay, it's a bit warp stabilizer, so it, it can work, um, but you're better off with a stabilized lens. So what are the other headline features of this camera? What makes it stand out? Well, it has dual ISOs. That means it has two native sensitivities. Native sensitivity is where it performs at its best image quality. So for example, with the C200, I think is just 800. Uh, with the Sony's, it depends on what uh, profile you're shooting in. And which camera. For example, the FS5, shooting an S-Log, the lowest you can go is 3200 ISO. That's where it performs at its best. Can't go any lower. You can go to other profiles to do that. But this one here has dual sensitivity. So when you're shooting in V-Log, which is the uh, Panasonic log, it is the lowest of the ISOs is 800, and the highest is 2500. Basically, there's two sets of pixels inside this sensor and it switches between them which is really good in theory does it work in practice well I will be doing some low light tests for you to have a look at later
It does record in 4K, proper DCI 4K, 1496 by 2160. And it has a 5.7K sensor for that. And it uses that to subsample into 4K, which um, in theory, I mean, I can't verify it because there's not two side-by-side -side versions of a 4K sensor and a 5.7K sensor on the same camera, the same processing. But in theory, and the technology and the facts and the mathematics and everything else makes sense. So the down sampling to 4K will give you better colors uh, and a nicer looking image. And in theory, it should also make it uh, a little bit more sensitive to light. We all love slow motion. I love slow motion. And we do have 4K up to 60p, which is really nice. Although it is not 60 frames per second, so it records it as your as P. So basically, that is your frame rate. You need to conform it in post. You can't shoot in overcrank in 4K. So you, unless I'm completely mistaken and got this wrong, you can't have your base time rate as 25P and then set your frames per second as 60 and or 50, and then it'll be instant slow motion. The upside is it does record sound when you're doing it that way. Now, if you want to go to uh, anything over that, so you have to drop down resolution. So you can shoot at um, 120p with full sensor uh, in HD and uh, 2K. And you can also shoot in 2K up to 240 frames per second. Now it does crop the sensor, goes into micro four thirds mode or four thirds mode. And that's interesting. Um, it's not actually that big a crop, surprisingly. It's not like, oh my God. So the downside with the C300 Mark II when I tested it is I thought it was really nice but it had no 4K over 30p, which is a big mistake, which the C200 does do, which is fantastic. And uh, if you want to go over, if you want to do your high frame rate of 100, 120p, it's a cropped sensor in HD, not even the full sensor, which is rubbish. Uh, the C200 again doesn't do that now. It's like fantastic, uh, but this will crop it. The C300 Mark II cropped so much, it was like, whoa, can't be doing that. This doesn't crop it that much, but it does crop it a little bit, and it is definitely softer, and it is it certainly looks a bit more compressed. This Panasonic camera has a Canon EF mount. Okay, that's good and that's bad. It's good because lots of people have Canon glass. The DSLR revolution made that happen. And if you have Nikon glass, or well, most Nikon glass, you can put it onto Canon cameras, Canon mount cameras, because a Nikon lens sits a little bit further away from the sensor, the flange is slightly bigger. And the only ones which won't work with an adapter will be the new electronic ones like I have on the D850, which is the 105 1.4. That has uh, a new electronic style aperture as opposed to the more mechanical ones, which you can get past with simple adapters. So this has a Canon mount. Now, I know a lot of Panasonic users, GH users, will probably have gone, oh, I wanted to have a Micro Four Thirds video camera. To be honest with you, that would have been a huge mistake. Not to offend any Micro Four Thirds users, 
and there's incredible glass out there for Micro Four Thirds. But if you want to compete with Canon, with Sony, then you need to have a sensor of at least the same size as the competition. You go in with a smaller sensor and it's an uphill battle. So having Super 35 was essential. So okay, a Canon EF mount is okay. You know, I have Canon glass, the C200. Obviously it has a EF mount. I would say the biggest downsides needs to come from the best upside, or one of the best upsides of using Sony E-mount. The great thing about Sony E-mount is it's so easy to adapt. There's adapters out there for every single type of glass. As long as it can fill the sensor, so you can't put like Super 16 on Super 35, obviously, you can get adapters out there. And that's amazing. The flexibility is huge. Yeah, you can stick with native Sony glass. And for many glass, many lenses, that's fine. You know, I really love the, the, the Fuji MK cinema lenses, which are nice and compact and small and pretty affordable, which are native to E-mount. And there's something really nice about using native glass. It tends to work better with the system. The downside being that most Sony native glass, the electronic stuff with autofocus, the manual focus is just abysmal. It really is on pretty much all of them out there. Very few exceptions. Canon glass isn't that much better, but it is better. It doesn't have focus by wire. It is slightly more mechanical, which makes it a bit better. I'm a big fan of manual focus for certain things, and I'm a big fan of autofocus for certain things like this. It just depends. I'd like to have the option for both, to be fair, which is, I don't know, maybe it's a little bit greedy. So with this, though, we are limited to just having EF uh, any lens which can fit on it, like a, a Nikon with an adapter, um, which is a shame. Now, there are companies out there like Wooden Camera who've uh, brought out an accessory, which means you have to unscrew this, take this off, and you can use PL lenses. It will avoid your warranty, but it means you can use PL glass. But for me, what I love about that Sony, going back to the Sony's, is, yeah, we have a Super 35mm sensor, but we can buy and use uh, something like a Metabone Speed Booster. And that will give us the aesthetics and look and even more light that a full frame will give you. So you can switch between the two. So if you want to have a shallower depth of field and you want to have a little bit more light, you put on the Speed Booster. And that works the same when we're using GH5s. We can get past that Micro Four Thirds crop using Speed Boosters to around Super 35, which is fantastic. But you can't do it with this. There is no ability to do this. You are stuck with stuck with Super 35, which is though industry standard. The camera records on SD cards. So very much like the GH5, you're gonna need fast SD cards if you are going to be recording in the high bit rate, especially when that firmware comes out with 400 megabit per second, you're gonna need some very fast UHS-2, I think they're called need those and they're not cheap but uh, eventually things get cheaper the batteries are the same as you get on the dvx 200 the newer camera and um yeah i had two character two batteries and i bought myself another one which is a ridiculous waste of money uh, but i need another one because when i went out filming on monday i was out filming for 12 hours and two's not enough and it takes forever to charge forever so I bought one, 150 quid for this review. One of my many expenses for this review, but hey, I needed the batteries. Um, they do bigger ones, so probably a couple of the big ones will probably last you all day. Um, but I managed to get by on three small ones without filming all day. Noodle, you're making a lot of noise. So ND filters, it doesn't have the amazing killer feature that the FS5 and the FS7 II has from Sony which is a built-in electronic variable ND filter, which is incredible. Once you've used a variable ND filter on the camera built-in, you don't want to use anything else because you're able to get exactly the amount of light uh, to come into the sensor without you know, having to go, or maybe need to up my shutter speed, or maybe need to close down a bit because it's too bright or too dark. This doesn't have that. It has three positions, and we have a little switch to flick between them. And the most stops we can get is six stops. Of light, which to be honest with you, in most grim grey days in London is fine, but for when that sun comes out, it's not enough. The C200 from Canon, for example, has 
12 stops. It doesn't have a variable ND, but it does have 12 stops, which is fantastic to have something like that. Of course, you can just add a variable ND filter, a high quality one, of course, onto your lens if you need to have that fine control. The dual sensitivity. So what excited me about the dual sensitivity was being able to be at 2,500 native and getting some great low light, clean low light stuff, as well as in shooting in, uh, in a situation where we have lots of light and we can go lower to 800, whereas problems with like the Sony's, uh, the FS5 is in log, you're 3,200 minimum. So if you're in bright light, you need a lot of ND. We do have a lot of ND in the camera, which does help. The thing is, having a dual sensitivity, having a second set of pixels on there, which work at 2500 ISO, will that make it better in low light? And I want great low light. Uh, will it be better than an FS5, uh, which shoots at 3200 ISO, and it's native anyway, which is already higher than 2500? The only way to find out is to test things. Uh, actually, one of my favorite cameras for low light, video cameras, because if we're talking about cameras for low light, there is only one camera for low light, which is truly exceptional for me, and that is the Sony A7S, and especially the A7S Mark II, because it shoots in 4K. And that is, uh, I hate to use that word, but the A7S was a game changer. And there is no camera out there which competes with it yet. But the C200 shoots in very good high ISOs. Canon C200, ISO 800, f1.8, tungsten balance, C-log 3 on the MP4. Um, I can't change the color matrix so it's not going to be as flat as the um, EVA1. But we're going to start uh, putting up ISO one step at a time to 1000 ISO, 1250 ISO, 1600 ISO, 2000 ISO, 2500 ISO, 3200, 4000, 5000, 6400, 8000, 10,000, 12,800, 16,000, 20,000, 25,600, that's high as it goes. So we'll start at 2500, which is the second base setting on this camera. And we've got 3200, 4000, 5000, 6400, 8000, 10,000, 12,800, 16,000, 20,000. 25,600, 
says they both go as high. Before I got the camera to play with from Panasonic, I was seeing stories about the hand grip and how that um, it was being, it was coming loose. So, and, and that's not good, it's slipping. So, I mean, this one, look, I'm pushing it quite hard. I'm not having any issues, but they have found a fault and they are replacing it. So that is good. The other thing though, is I have found something else which isn't great, which breaks, and that is the sun hood, um, which is broken right now. Look, here are the other bits of it. So this happened on day two of filming, which is not good. Look, I consider myself a really good tester of cameras because uh, I'm not the gentlest when it comes to gear. Uh, in, I, don't, I don't do silly things or anything like that, but I, I carry it on a, a camera strap so it's banging against my body and things like that. So. I, I treat things as they should be treated, like a working camera. And on day two, half of the day, it, it fell apart. And this is not the first I've read about it, um, seen about it online, so that's not good. That needs to be fixed. Uh, because the LCD does need a sun hood. Um, it's incredibly reflective. Um, let's know who, I don't get why we are still having issues with LCD screens on cameras, uh, why they're so poor. Um, the C200 one has a really nice one. It's still reflective, but it's bright and it's big. Uh, this is small, it's um, very reflective, and it's not that bright. You can give it a boost. You can up the backlight in the settings and you can program a custom key to give it a boost to make it look brighter. Uh, and I've done that, I've programmed this slot select button, because there's not that many left after the key things I wanted, and it gives it a little bit of a boost. But that's annoying, and I have to have a custom key just to bring up that brightness of the LCD. Um, it's not a great LCD. Um, I have to be completely frank, it's a disappointing LCD. And I spent my entire time when I was filming with the camera using this monitor here, which is um, the small HD, 503, which is very bright daylight monitor, something like 2,200 nits, um, which is, you know, very bright. So uh, that is a big problem. And the other thing, this comes into, it is small, and these are not my reading glasses. My eyesight's just got so bad in the past six months, I just don't know why. I mean, I've spent too long editing the um, cinematic math class and it screwed my eyesight. Um, but the text, the settings on the camera, are in a, they're not over the, the actual image, and a small black border top and bottom. And it's so small that when I met with Panasonic at IBC to look over the camera with them, I was asking them, so tell me, what does that say? I can't read it. And we ended up taking a photo of it on the phone to have a look and see what it was. Um, but with reading glasses, I can read it, but it's so small, I mean, it's so small. You can press a button on the side, which will give you all your settings and fill the whole screen. But obviously if you're in the middle of filming something, that's not a very good option. Yeah, so again, the screen is a disappointment. Uh, you can move it to different positions. It's a very FS5-ish, this is. Uh, you can move it to here or here uh, or here. Um, it does get loose quite easily. And it is a proprietary connector uh, and it's sealed uh, into the, the um, screen on this side, uh, which means if you do have a damaged cable, you need to, need to send the whole thing in. And the biggest problem with that is without the LCD screen, you have no idea what you are doing operating the camera. Sure, you can plug in an external monitor, but if your settings aren't right and it's not outputting the, the menus, you're screwed because there's no EVF. There's a big hole. Well, not a big hole. There's a big black nothingness where the EVF is. Now, you got a. The C200 has an EVF, and you can get a model which doesn't have the EVF, which is kind of more for gimbals and for drones. And the EVF isn't that great. Totally frank, it isn't that great. The ones on the Sony's 
aren't that great. There is one on the uh, FS5 at the back as well as an LCD screen. With the FS7 it is an LCD screen with a loop. Um, none of them are great and it, I just find it amazing. You know, the, the EVF on the GH5 is actually really good. Uh, the ones on the um, the A9, so the A9, the A7R3, and even the A7R2 and A7S2 are pretty good. So why we can't have a decent EVF on a camera that costs this much money is beyond me. Yeah, of course you can buy additional ones, and when I'm out shooting professionally, I do. I use my Zakuto Graticle, um, the Graticle X on my FS7 and FS5 all the time for handheld because I need that critical focus. I can't have a substandard EVF. But wouldn't it be nice if all EVFs would come with cameras? The one, you know, these. I'm not talking about the, you know, the big, you know, bigger cameras, the Alexas and Reds and stuff, which you wouldn't expect that to come with. But for something like this, it can't be that difficult to get a decent EVF, surely. And I'm not just talking to Panasonic. I'm talking to Canon. I'm talking to Sony. Please put in an EVF that you can actually use. Honestly, if you had a great EVF and a great LCD screen, you'll make so many of your customers happy. And you'll probably get new customers too. The programmable buttons on the side, uh, you do have writing on some of them. And I changed a couple of them, to be honest with you, not most. Um, um, one thing that was slightly a bit quirky was shutter speed. So you need to program on your shortcut user switch to be for shutter speed. And then this switch will flick between your ISO, uh, your white balance, or your user, which is set for my shutter. And then you use this dial to change your settings. So other cameras have a, a dedicated switch for your ISO or your gain, a dedicated switch for your shutter speed, um, and a dedicated one for your ISO. This has it all in one, which you never even want to change all three at the same time, but it can be a little bit fiddly sure and I did find I don't know why it was doing this but frequently the shutter speed which can shutter speed adjustments can be turned off in the menu and it was happening to me and I don't know what I was doing but I frequently had that I mean look, if I had the camera longer I probably would have got past all of these little quirks the camera has two mic inputs proper inputs we're talking XLRs it's a video camera it's the part of the reason why we want video cameras because proper audio handling. Um, and then you have your pots on the side here and you can switch between auto and manual. Uh, slightly quirkily that if you want to change from mic to line or put in 48 volt phantom, you have to do that in the menus. So again, other cameras have that as switches. So uh, we don't have that on here. We have to go into menus and menus. Menus aren't fun. Menus are a pain. I mean, I, I use a lot of different cameras, a lot of different brands, and even within brands, especially Sony, they're all so different. But when I switch between this or a C200 or an FS5 or a Nikon, uh, any of the cameras that I use, or my Fuji, I use Fuji a lot as well, um, it's, it does my head in. I'm trying to remember everything because they're all so different, and some are intuitive and some are not. So the menus in here are fine but they're not perfect. Um, I would get used to them again. With the more use, and if you didn't switch between different cameras, you'll get, you get used to them. So uh, it's not as confusing as some of the Sony menus, but uh, um, at least it's really snappy and really quick at responding. I mean, design-wise, it, it's very reminiscent of the FS5. It's a little bit um, fatter, but a lot of things are very similar, like the, the handle and the way it attaches here. Um, the look of it, the way the, the grip is here, the connector looks really similar on here. Uh, obviously, that's, it, it's skin deep though, because inside they're very, very different cameras, and that's really what matters. And we have lots of connectors on here. We have uh, HDMI at the top here. We have a USB uh, 2. I don't know why we have USB 2. I mean, USB 2 is so long ago. Um, but my, most people don't really connect up these cameras USB. You use a reader. Um, and we have uh, SDI and we have headphones and uh, one of the nicest features that we have is time code in and out, which we don't get on the Sony's, the FS7, the FS5, the FS7 does have it if you use the, um, the external uh, add-on at the back. 
So it's really nice to have that. So if you are trying to sync up multiple cameras, having your time code in and out is a really, really nice feature. And it's something I'd like to see on other cameras. There is actually one feature that most people overlook and actually really excites me, and that is the ability to shoot infrared with this camera. If you know what infrared is, I have blog posts all about it, but basically we have all of the spectrum of light. We have UV light, and we have a normal color spectrum, and then we have um, infrared light, as well as also other lights. Cameras will pick up infrared lights unless they have a, an infrared blocker over the sensor. All cameras generally have this, um, and you can't do anything about it. You can't remove it, or you can. And I have actually had them removed on some of my cameras. I had quite a few of my stills cameras modified so I could shoot video and stills in infrared and create very interesting looks. With this camera, though, you can swing away the infrared blocker which makes it a full spectrum sensor. It sees all the natural colors of the spectrum, as well as infrared. It's very polluted. It's not something you want to shoot with, it's not very good. So you put on infrared uh, pass-through filters, which basically lets some or none of natural colors through, and it creates these really interesting effects. And I use different filters with strengths of uh, 590 nanometers, which lets in some of the colors, and we have 650s, like one of my favorites. In fact, I shot the Las Vegas in infrared using a Sony RX100 Mark IV modified to infrared, and that had a 650 nanometer um, filter on it, and it looks fantastic. Or well, if you want to make it uh, basically so it's, it's much more traditional uh, infrared, then you want to go for 720 nanometers or higher. I did go out and I did try it because it's a big thing for me to have a camera that does this. Although the actual commercial aspects of it, how much I would use in my work, I would say negligible. All my infrared experiments in the past three years or so has been for myself. And it's fun. It's, uh, people ask, what's the benefit? There's no benefit. It's about being creative and trying different things. And it can be a really striking way of filming but not something you want to do too much of so i took it out so one of the first things i did with the camera was try out the infrared mode so i'm not going to take up too much time going through infrared if you want to shoot infrared with this camera you just need to be aware of a few things so you do need to get some filters to go on front of your lenses so in fact you can buy a like a, a variable ir which will go everything from like 550 to 800, just like a variable ND. We can get fixed ones as well. You're gonna get better quality with the fixed ones and you're also gonna know exactly what you have it set to. Um, you will find though, when you put your filter on, that everything looks incredibly red and nasty. You get much better results when you're trying to shoot infrared if you're shooting raw, because you have much more ability to manipulate the colors in post because white balance is metadata, for example. And white balance is one of the biggest issues. So when I'm using the stills cameras to be modified, the way that I get a white balance is gonna give me accurate infrared colors. It does depend on the filter, but for the most part, I will white balance on green foliage, like leaves and grass. In daylight, has to be in daylight. 
and that will actually give me a white balance which is pretty good you can't get that white balance in in premiere and stuff by fiddling with things you can in something like davinci resolve if you've got it completely screwed up but the problem is you start trying to screw up with your white balance trying to make things so drastically different from what they recorded at it's if it's not a really strong codec like raw it's going to have issues and it will fall apart and i did find that so i was trying to white balance with this camera on foliage and it won't work so auto white balance the button at the front where you point it with a lens and you point it the green and try and get a white balance doesn't work in infrared mode and also uh, only one of the nds i think it's up to uh maybe it's 1.2 i'm not sure will work in infrared mode it's because they're all linked on the same mechanism or something and you do need to cut down light in in uh, infrared mode as well so uh, you can dial in a white balance, um, but you can't get it to as you want it to be. So you really need your greens pushed uh, right up. And so what I've done, and I spent a lot of time tweaking this, was go into, you have to come out of log, don't be in vlog, because you cannot change your pitch profile settings in vlog. You go into one of the scene files. And in a scene file, you're going to your um, color matrix, and you change your, your settings in there, your red, green, and blue settings. And it's trial and error. So I think I've got some good results. And if you look at my blog post, uh, I'll give you some screen grabs of what I programmed it for. You can save your scene files into, uh, onto the SD card of your camera so you can recall them later. A word of warning though, if you're used to cameras like the FS7, for example, where you have your SD cards purely for things like scene files, you won't have the issue like you do here. So your scene files are only on that local card. So if you take that card out and you turn it off and on again and done whatever you've done, you can't bring them back unless you put that, that card with those scene files back in there. So it's worthwhile, if you are going to be messing around with infrared and other scene file profiles that you've created, it's had just a low capacity, like an eight or 16 gigabyte card, which is dedicated for your scene files. And just keep that with your camera bag and in there. That's your scene file card. Don't bother putting them on the actual recording cards. It's not going to work. It really isn't because you're going to just forget things and you're going to go, oh, which one had my scene files on? Have a dedicated SD card for your scene files. And I did loads of infrared filming um, at Richmond Park because green and trees are a great thing to film in infrared with blue skies. The problem is getting blue skies and you want those leaves and trees to be lit by the sun and there wasn't a lot of that so well i'm not hugely happy with what i got uh, but it wasn't bad and once i got those color matrix profiles to more or less what i wanted them to be although i really was only i would say 60 percent happy with what i got uh it wasn't too bad and i would really need a lot more time with it a lot more experimenting i really only had a day and a bit where I was messing around with the infrared because I needed to make sure that I didn't just obsess over that and forget about normal filming with the camera. So what do I think of the image? I think the image is really nice and that is one of the most important things. In fact, it's the most important thing. When you're looking at a camera to buy, you have a list of features that you're after, but the very top should always be, I need fantastic image quality or IQ. What's the IQ like? So, image quality is fantastic. It looks really nice in 4K. To be totally frank with you, I have not shot HD at normal speed. I'm sorry, I know people wanna know, but I didn't do it. I have so much other things that, that are useful for me. I didn't do any HD normal speed, and I'm sure it looks fine, I'm guessing. But the 4K looks terrific. It looks really, really nice. I'm very happy with the 4K image and that is important. Dynamic range is fantastic. It holds things really well. The log is really good. And even 8-bit, the 4K 50 slash 60p looks terrific. You can grade it just fine as long as you get your exposure nice and spot on. It's really hard to give final thoughts on the camera I don't feel that I've experienced enough with. Uh, but I am being put on the spot and I think the EVA1 is, is terrific. 
Um, I think it's a really, really good camera. It's got a lot going for it. The size and the weight and the image quality is superb. My biggest issues, I would say, it's not a lot that it does that the FS7 doesn't already do. And it's competing with the FS7 Mark II in price more than the FS5. And the FS7 Mark I, which is very similar to the FS7 Mark II, bar the variable ND and slightly change mount, is, I mean, that's a three, over three year old camera. And I would like this to have had a lot more in it than a camera which it's competing with, which is over three years old. Yeah, but feature-wise and image-wise, um, the image is really nice. And there you're going to get into people saying, oh, I, I prefer Panasonic's Color Science than Sony's, and that's fine. Personally, I have no problem with Sony's Color Science or Canon's or Panasonic's, and I can make anything look like what I want it to do in post. Is it a camera that I would buy? Now, if I didn't already own all these other cameras, um, I think the answer may well be yes, potentially. Um, the FS7 is, is, is a very robust camera, very well made, very solid, and terrific image quality, terrific features. Uh, if you want raw out of it, you do need to get the external back. With a firmware upgrade later, we will be able to get raw out of this into an external recorder. Um, the Canon C200 has raw light built into it, but not a great other internal codec. Um, the FS5, um, doesn't shoot 4K over 30p, and uh, it's only 8-bit. In HD, it is 10-bit. But if you get the raw upgrade for that, you can, again, it's just in the back of the camera, you go into a recorder like a Shogun Inferno, and you can get some incredible looking images out of the camera. Suddenly you're able to, I'm not talking about recording raw, you take the raw signal out of the camera into the Shogun Inferno, it converts it into ProRes for you, and you can have 4K 60p and 50p 10 bits. It looks beautiful. But the slow motion of the FS5 internally is only in a buffered mode. So it's about, you know, you can record about eight seconds at a time and then it has to write it, which can be a pain, although it can save you a lot of card space. But with the raw out and the, the system of the Inferno in there, you can record ProRes at up to 240p in bit and it looks amazing although it's no longer a small camera because you have this recorder on there but it is a big massive improvement the raw uh, output from the fs5 transforms that camera into something way better than it is on its own it's fine on its own it's just internal stuff but that lack of 4k 60p for me is is a pain in the ass and this has it all this has the 4k 50p 60p the high frame rate though is a crop sensor and not uh, as good, but it is continuous though. 240 frames is continuous, not eight seconds like the FS5. But the FS7 can do 180 frames per second continuous, and it looks terrific. The C200 can only do 120 frames per second continuous, but again, full sensor. You kind of just want them to just get together and make one camera which takes the best of all the things and to make us all happy. It would never happen. Of course, it's never going to happen, but wouldn't it be nice? If Canon said, hey, take our color science, take our autofocus, enjoy, use it for this camera. And Sony will go, yeah, we're putting our 10-bit really great codec and other features that are really nice, the high frame rates and stuff without cropping the sensor. Great. And Panasonic will go, we have this dual sensitivity sensor. It's fantastic technology. Put that in there, be amazing. Wouldn't that be an amazing camera if we had the best of everything? But we don't. So currently it becomes a difficult choice to make for people. I can't give you an answer in this video. All I can say is once you have tasted autofocus uh, that works so well that the C200 does, then it's hard to use anything else. I rely on it a lot when I'm filming interviews and using DSLR lenses, like long lenses, and trying to follow people for B-roll shots and keep them in focus. It's so, so hard doing it manually with really tiny travel. But when you have all focus, you can touch the screen, it can track them, and then you program a button to make it focus, hold before they go out of frame so it doesn't revert to the background. It's amazing. 
The autofocus in here is not continuous. It has a push autofocus contrast based system, not dual pixel system. So that is, this system on this camera is so good, the C200 for autofocus. This is the worst. The FS5 and FS7 at least does have continuous autofocus. It isn't great, but it is there and it can work sometimes. Sometimes it isn't good enough. If you are going to have autofocus, it needs to work. And that's why for 27 years I've been shooting, only in the past couple of years or so, autofocus has become something that I can actually start to use professionally. I mean, look, I'm at 1.4 and I'm in focus. That's a big deal. As Percy walks in front of the camera, are you just going to hover here? Purse? Percy? So here's a great autofocus. There we go. Percy stuck his head up and <laughs> it racked to him. Um, Percy, you're too close for minimum focus on that Sigma 35mm. Uh, it can just about see me. Hello. Percy, you're kind of ruining the flow of things. Good. Okay, you can say there we get a little bit of uh, a dirty frame with his, his tail and stuff in there frame. Oh, he's just going to go stand there. I may need to cut on this bit here. So it is a really nice camera. It's a nice design, nice, lovely image quality. Uh, usability is fine. The screen is awful, needs an EVF. I'm disappointed about being uh, limited to Canon EF glass, lack of autofocus. The dual sensitivity is a nice feature to have. The infrared ability is really nice. Well, thank you very much for watching and putting up with my rambling. And I hope you, if you buy an EVA one, you create some beautiful images with it. Enjoy, it's a lovely camera.